The lecture was, is historical, historically called the introduction to particle physics. In truth, I do whatever I want around here, so I've changed it a little since I've been giving it. And it's really an introduction to science at Fermilab. And one of the things that's happened is we do more than just particle physics here. We do astrophysics and we do cosmology. And those things are all related and tied together. And so we hope to give you an idea of how all of that works in the lectures. So this is an overview that I might follow as we go through the lectures. Uh, one of the things that's important uh, to me to try to convey to you is something about science and how science came about. And that means some history, that means some philosophy. Uh, it turns out that philosophy is very important subject for science because that's where science began. One of the paths actually led to something useful. There's no philosophy people in here to hear me say things like that. But anyway, that's where it started. So we're going to talk about the philosophy of science and we're going to talk about some history from a philosophical point of view of how we got where we are. And then that will be sort of the first half of the lecture. Then in the second half of the lecture, I'm going to be, give you a preview. In this series of lectures, uh, Saturday Morning Physics, we're going to visit the far reaches of the universe. We're going to uh, travel about 3,000, 2,000 years in this first part. But in doing that, we will travel from the beginning of time down to the smallest kernels or particles in the universe. So this is quite a, a big trip. And we're going to try to do it in such a way that it's coherent and you'll understand something about where we're going and why. So that's my goals for today. And the last part of it will, I'll briefly introduce you to some particle physics and astrophysics and cosmology. The thing that you should remember about my lecture is that, that it's a preview. I'm going to raise a lot of questions. I'm going to answer very few questions, except the ones you ask that I can answer. And so you should, if I'm successful, you will leave this lecture confused and disoriented. Be, be careful on the steps. But you should be looking forward to the next lectures. I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview of all the things that are coming up in the future. So what we do here, and what has been a prime question for humanity for a long time, is what is this world we live in? And when you ask a question like that, uh, one of the ways you think you have an answer is you imagine that, okay, how would I build this world if I were just starting from scratch and wanted to end up with this world or this universe and so on. And so, you know, a, a trivial way to think about it is when I was a kid, we had tinker toys that we built things out of. They weren't real good for doing that, but it was somewhat satisfying to see how you could take some little parts and construct something that had nothing to do with the parts or seemingly so. Now we have Lego blocks and other fancy things that we didn't have then. But we trying to do the same thing here. What we want to do is sort of break the matter of the universe that uh, cons we know all of this thing, these things exist. We want to understand the details of those Lego, Lego blocks, if you will, so that we know how the universe is all put together and then we think we'll be satisfied. After we understand all of that, you might ask, well, then what will we do? And we understand some of it now. We've done some good things and some bad things, so you'll hear about that. But the universe also has some other components, and it's not clear that they're really different than these, but there's the stuff in the universe, and then there's space, which we used to think had three dimensions, I'm going to expand your mind. These lectures will expand your mind to think as high as uh, 11 or 12 dimensions by the time we're finished. And what else is missing here? There's an obvious thing that's missing. Time, exactly. And it's not so clear that time is really different than that. We're going to be talking about time today. And I wrote down one dimension. You might not think that's important. But if you're like me, Time has some serious constraints. And if we're going to talk about extra dimensions of space, I want to talk about extra dimensions of time because I seem to need at least two dim dimensions of time for my existence. In other words, I don't have enough time to get everything done, but if I had another dimension, it would work better. Okay, 
So these are, are the things that are going to be important for us to study. And of course, we're going to ask some fundamental questions like what makes them different and uh, are they really different? I mean, we'll talk a little bit later, but Einstein showed that space and time are intimately related, and it's not clear from the equations that they're very different, although time and space do not enter into the equations in exactly the same way. But there are very similar uh, properties and qualities to space and time. And then we'll also ask, is this everything? And it turns out that we know there are more things in the universe than we understand. And so that may mean there's things yet to be added to this list. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So what was the first attempt to figure out, uh, and maybe this wasn't exactly the first attempt because people thought about it before that, but this one's sort of documented. The Greeks figured out that the Earth, or that the world was made out of these components, Earth, air, fire, and water. And since you've all been to school, you think, well, that was a, a pretty dumb thing to come up with because uh, that's pretty elementary. On the other hand, if you put yourself in a position of where you're really trying to figure this out for the first time, this isn't a bad guess because they tried to break things down into fundamental components as best they could, and this is what they came up with. The one thing that the Greeks were a little weak on that uh, they started to worry about was making observations or doing experiments to test these things, and one of the things that you might do to test this hypothesis of that everything is made out of this, is you could ask yourself, can you make everything in the world out of these things? And if so, why? How? You need a recipe. And in fact, uh, these days we know that you can't. Pizza is a good example. You need something more than just these things. This is not meant to be serious. Anyway, this is special magical stuff, and so we need more, more components. Now, the, the Greeks were great philosophers, and they gave a lot of thought to questions like this, because these thoughts were really awakening in the human mind at that time. And Democritus was a clever guy, and he thought it would be very satisfying and a good idea if you could make a world out of things like Lego blocks, that there was something some smallest component that you could break the world down to so that if you understood that component and understood how it fit together with everything else, you would understand the world. So he had this theory and he called his basic components atoms. The, the question that could not be answered at that time was uh, whether this notion was correct or not. It just seemed like a good idea. Then Aristotle came along, and Aristotle was real good at making observations, but he wasn't good at making an observation that could test that theory. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the second half. Now this notion came from just logical thinking, which was starting to come in fashion at that time. And if you combine both logical thinking and observations, or as you'll see later, experiments, uh, those two notions tend to constrain thoughts because it turns out that the mind is, a, is an amazing thing. As you all know your mind can conceive of things that don't exist. And some of those things are really scary and I don't want to know about them. But <laughs> people, people's minds, when left uh, unchecked, come up with many things. So we need this idea of making observations and doing experiments so that we uh, can see what the world is really like. So now I'm going to talk just a little bit about how we make observations and how information from the, quote, real world, unquote, gets to us. We'll talk a little bit about what real world means in a second. But the basic way that information gets to us is through light waves, sound waves, chemical reactions on our tongue, chemical reactions in our fingers, electrical impulses, chemical reactions in our noses. And you can see here, I'm really just talking about the five senses that you all know about. Once science got started, 
we added another sense here, and that's man-made detectors. And man-made detectors, as you'll see in the course of Saturday morning physics, greatly extends those senses. You can see things that you couldn't possibly hope to see with your eyes, but if you know how to make, if you know how the eye works, it turns out you can make a detector that can see uh, far deeper in the space and far see uh, far down farther down into the basic constituents of matter. So let me just remind you very quickly how we see, because I'm going to bring this up again later. It's going to be important to how we do experiments here. And so suppose I have something in a box and I want to know what it is and you know me well enough that you might be afraid to stick your hand in there and, and see, try to find out what it is. So right away you can imagine using some technology. So you go down to the drugstore and you buy yourself a flashlight for about 385 and you take your flashlight, you shine it into the dark closet or the box, light bounces off the object in there and some of the light that bounces off the object gets reflected into your eye. Other light goes in all different directions from the flashlight. Your eye processes the light that comes there and turns it into data that gets sent to the brain. The brain does an extremely complicated analysis and tells you what's in the box. For example, your brain easily recognizes the soccer ball, but if you sit down to the right software to recognize the soccer, soccer ball, you see that that's not a trivial uh, matter to be able to recognize this in all kinds of situations. So just remember that. That's how we see. And then the next question I'm going to raise is, I mentioned a while ago the real world, and I think we have to to address the question of what is the real world and how do we know what's real and what isn't. And philosophers have argued about that for centuries, but science has answered the question as far as science is concerned. We, can, we actually have uh, a good definition of what is real. And part of the problem, though, in any of this is that our senses we know can deceive us. And as I get older and older, I find more and more evidence that my senses deceive me more and more. So get ready for it. Most of you will go through this too. So detectors can be faulty, so we have to figure out a way to deal with this. And then there's this other matter. There's something very strange that goes on in the human brain. The human brain came up with mathematics and logic, and that all seems just right to us. And so it causes us to think that we can re really discover the nature of reality through just pure thinking. But you also know that the brain can play tricks on you. So this is a tricky, tricky business when you start talk, talking about logic and what relationship it bears to reality. So we need some method or way to figure out in some consistent logical way how to interpret the information that comes to us through our sensors and other detectors. And we need to figure out a way to understand this relationship of re reasoning to reality. So let's, let's very quickly define reality. So suppose two experimenters are going to try to observe the same thing or do the same experiment. And what happens is one person does the experiment and he gets this for a result. And then the next person does the experiment same experiment and gets this for the result, then we know that something is wrong and we know that somebody, there's some logical inconsistency here or inconsistency in the way the experiment is done. So we keep trying until we can reproduce as many times as we want uh, the experiment and get the same result. And that is our basic science definition of reality. You have to be able to either make an observation or do an experiment, and you have to get consistent results every time, and then all the rest of reality is just philosophy as far as we're concerned. This is what determines what the real world is, if we can do experiments over and over and get the same result. Turns out this is a very simple concept, but it's very powerful. 
And it took us quite some time in human history to, to learn how to do this. And in fact, we're still learning how to do it. Now, as far as adding in the logic and the, the uh, mathematics and the things from our human brain, it turns out that numbers seem to be very important because they quantify what we see. And so we cannot do these experiments without understanding these numbers and the relationships that they bear to the real world when we use them. Okay. So here is how we're, we go about learning about the world now that we have our, our scientific method. We know that we want to understand the stuff that makes up the world. We've already talked about how we'd like to make it out of something like building, like Lego blocks or, or two before and plywood and then we would understand uh, the result, the house, or the universe. We also know that somehow this stuff has to have a place to be, and so we have these other uh, more esoteric concepts here. And then we know that if we're going to learn about the world and make any sense of it, we have to do these experiments and observations, and right now I will tell you we need good tools to do that, and the tools we we're talking about are the detectors that are extended beyond our senses, the numbers and the logic and reasoning that go with them, and then we convince ourselves that we know something about the world. And as I already indicated, this turns out to be a very uh, powerful way of learning things. So let's talk just a little bit about these other two concepts. I think if, if I told you we want to know about stuff, that's fairly easy for you to conceive of it. But when we say what we're going to learn about space, that's a little more difficult because to first order you will tend to think that space is really nothing unless something's in it and then all of a sudden it's something or something like that. I mean, it's a philosophical thing. But it turns out that we're learning a lot about space and you will learn that in this universe there is no such thing as nothing and it's surprising that we have a word for it. So that'll be important. Anyway, space can be quantified. Coordinates, distance, volume, things like that. Mathematics can be used to, to uh, define the relationships between these numbers that describe space. And so uh, that will help us to organize our thoughts on the matter. And then we can start asking really silly questions like how much space is there? that question makes sense to people? It turns out that's a very important question. Some of you might tell me, well, there's an infinite amount of space, and I might argue with you that there's not. And you would say, well, if you say there's only so much space, I would say, what's that outside of space? And it turns out that's an irrelevant or an incorrect question, because there is nothing outside of that space, and nothing doesn't Never mind, it gets really good. <laughs> so how much space there is is an important question. And one of the most amazing things about space that goes against our common sense, which will happen over and over in these lectures, because you haven't been where we're going, and common sense is based on where you've been, but space is expanding. And many of you probably think, well, space is expanding, the, the galaxies are flying apart. What does that mean? The galaxies are not really flying apart in the sense that you think. The space between them is expanding. And this is a rather strange predicament to find ourselves in because we're not used to the notion that space can expand. But that's what's happening, and in our cosmology lecture we'll convince you, that, attempt to convince you that this is in fact the case. And then there's a matter of time. If I asked any of you what time is, you'd probably have an answer for me. You'd look at your watch and you'd say, there it is right there. <laughs> but do you really know what time is? Yes. Time is an illusion to the moment we respond. Time is an illusion to the, the moments we respond. To the moments we respond. That's a pretty interesting answer. And it turns out that uh, when you really think about it, uh, time may not be what what you normally think about. It, 
you tend to think of it as something absolute, something that separates events. So let me give you some idea of, of the way we think about it and then give you some notion of, of what's wrong with the way we think about it. The illusion part is extremely interesting because I guess I'll bring this up now. Famous math mathematician Kurt Gödel uh, demonstrated back in the 1950s, he was a friend of Einstein's at the Advanced Institute of Princeton, and he wrote a proof that no one's ever been able to find anything wrong with. He used the general theory of relativity, and he showed that time cannot pass. And the only way you can get around that is if you invoke the illusion part, so that this is an illusion in your mind. Okay, so now you should be a little upset. Is the uncertainty principle? This is not the uncertainty principle. We'll talk about the uncertainty principle, but it is... Uh, it's, a, it, it's interesting because it, once Gödel proved his, in a six-page paper, proved this, no one has ever uh, found any problem with the paper, but people have pretty much ignored it. It's not something that we want to know if that's the case. So this is this is false I don't know. <laughs> so we're going to talk about this more. We're getting ahead of me, which is okay, because then I'll be able to see myself coming a little later. <laughs> okay, so time, basically time is something that separates events. We don't really know what events are yet, but it gives them a particular order. And time is what keeps everything from happening at once. That used to be kind of my favorite definition, but since I have big jobs here where everything tries to happen at once, I see that time doesn't really work very well for that. Whoops, what did I do? And of course, numbers and, and uh, relationships are always going to be important. And then we ask how much space is there? Does it make sense to ask how much time there is? I think I'll convince you that it probably does. And then there's more than one kind of time that we'll talk about. But one of the things you can ask is, did time have a beginning? And if you've heard the Big Bang Theory then you, you, and you believe it, then you think, well, the universe all began, so that's the beginning of time. That's not absolutely certain, but it is clear if you wind time into space and matter, then you can ask these questions. And in fact, when I first got involved in astrophysics, this was a question we were trying to ask at the time. People were trying to see, to measure the amount of matter in the universe, to see if it would gravitationally pull the universe all back together so that it expands out and then it comes back together into a big crunch and time would end. So, as it turns out, the universe had a lot more matter in it than we thought because there was something mysterious, dark matter, but now that has taken a strange turn that I'll tell you about later. Then another question, is time absolute? And what I mean by that is if any two of you in this room are, who are in inertial frames, which means you're not accelerating, but one of you could be going cruising along in a car, would you all agree on a particular order that you gave events by assigning times to them? And then uh, Here's this silly question again, just to remind you that there are silly questions. And then is time really different from space? And so, oh, the, how did we first begin thinking of time? The, this is something that, uh, if, if we have this illusion going on, how did it start? And uh, initially, we knew there was something about time, but we didn't really know whether it extended beyond our lives and so on and so until we developed a good sense of communication and could talk about it. This is the real question here. I ask why space is expanding well ago. Now because of this matter of the illusion, we can ask why is the clock running? And what does that mean? So we're coming up with some pretty fundamental questions here to ask. And Early on, what, is, what does time mean? You just count how many times the sun appears and disappears, and you can use numbers to quanti uh, quantify that. 
and this is sort of the earliest way you did things. You also observe patterns in the seasons and motions of the sun and moon. These things repeated so you could count them with numbers and, and uh, learn something about the passage of time. And it turned out that this was a useful skill to have because you could keep track of uh, the seasons, know when to uh, plant your crops and so on if you were part of an uh, agricultural society. And then, of course, people found time more and more important as time, as, as time went on. <laughs> and they developed more sophisticated ways for measuring time, sundials, water clocks, mechanical clocks. And this got to be a big industry in the, about the 13th century. And then, of course, time became very important if you were trying to navigate the ship. And one of the questions you might ask early on is how did people figure out that time extended beyond their individual lives? And now that we've sort of agreed for the moment that it may be an illusion, the question doesn't have a lot of meaning. But communication is a simple answer. You started when people, when people learned how to talk to one another, they kind of figured out that there were people who lived before them and people who lived before their parents things like that because stories and legends were memorized and passed along and time was measured in funny ways by lives, counting the moons, counting the years, which is still what we do. And then people uh, uh, got these ideas of religion again. Uh, these religion answered some of these questions for people to make them feel comfortable with the whole notion of time. And then a, another way that we began to, to try and understand time was through rational reconstruction. And this gets to the more scientific uh, method where we make observations and even do experiments, combine them with, with reasoning and relationships of numbers. And then there's this important notion for our world that seems to be true to us. The causality is very important. Everything that happens is caused by something else. If you get rid of the principle of causality, then you're pretty much left with chaos. So these just tell where these things come from. And this one, as I said, is the more scientific whoops, way. And so now let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, the conclusion that time had a beginning. And that, as I said, comes from science. This particular theory of the Big Bang You'll find scientists who are skeptical of it. Uh, the measurements we've made so far and the observations are very compelling, but there are ways around this. So, and then what if there were other universes where time was going on too? And that's an interesting question. Will it go on forever? And I already told you this was one of the experiments that I was involved in, uh, trying to understand the dark matter that would pull, cause there would be enough gravity to pull everything together. But in the process of studying this, another experiment found out that there's something going on besides gravity, and it's called dark energy, and it's tending to push things apart. So right now, the answer to this question looks like it might be yes, although I will show you something that would argue against that in just a moment. And so here's, here's sort of a summary. So time separates events, and experiments and observations can be made, and now we're going to ask these questions seriously, and uh, surprisingly, we're going to find out that the answer to both of these questions is no, and we'll try to see how this came about and why it's important. So there's this matter of chaos and order, so right now you're going to see some things flash up on the screen, and then if I ask you to tell me what happened, you would have some difficulty coming up with a coherent story of just what you saw when a detective asked you about it. But if you imagine that there's time involved, so that things happen in a particular order, such as the following, this is me and my girlfriend having a good time together, this is my girlfriend's boyfriend, <laughs> who looks pretty threatening. This is me after he got a hold of me. <laughs> and this is me a little bit later. And so what happens is you put these events in order, 
and you tie them all together through time and you get a coherent story. And so it's important to know just which events happen when. So what we have here is matter somehow interacting and in time and space and we connect them all through causality. And so if we didn't have time, we'd probably have to invent it. So now a little bit about what an event is. That's just stuff interacting with some other stuff at a particular point in space time, like that. And then we're going to, of course, be asking what the stuff is, but we're also going to be asking how it's connected, how it's connected to space time. So we will have to invoke some other uh, concepts, and one of them will be forces, which we'll talk a little bit about in the end. This is my favorite, second favorite cyclist. My first favorite was Lance Armstrong, because I think he could have beat Albert in the Tour de France. <laughs> anyway, Albert Einstein was very important. Special relativity, we're going to talk about how he came up with the concept that there is no absolute time, what it means. And then he went on to do general relativity, which you'll only have a brief introduction to uh, later on, but it does try to connect the stuff to space and time. So he was an important person. This all started with the principle of relativity that was first uh, set down by Isaac Newton, surprisingly, and that is the, the motions of all bodies, uh, this is too complicated, let's do the modern version. The laws of physics take the same form in all frames of reference, moving with constant velocity with respect to one another. It's just what I told you a while ago. If you're in an inertial frame, such as a car moving down the highway at 60 miles an hour, or say it's a motorhome just for fun, you and your partner can still play catch with baseball, just like you were out standing beside the street. And so that's what we mean by the laws of physics being uh, constant in all inertial frames. If you start with that and then add one important ingredient that Einstein added, and the reason he added this was probably because he started with this principle of relativity that the laws of physics should be the same in all inertial frames. And he saw that the equations that Maxwell had come up with for electromagnetic interactions did not transform properly so that this would be true. Those laws were different in different inertial frames. Unless the transformation in space took a particular form. Now other people might argue that Einstein knew this fact because Michelson and Morley had done an experiment that showed that the speed of light seemed to be the same whether you were going in this direction and the light was coming this way on Earth, or perpendicular or even the opposite direction. And Einstein probably was aware of this, but I think what was much more important to Einstein was how those equations transformed. So he took a transformation that had been created earlier by Lorentz, and he came up with a special theory of relativity. And I won't go through the equations here this morning because you'll get them later, but I'll just show you basically what the impact is. Here is me on my bicycle. I don't look quite as good as Einstein. And this happens to me a lot when I'm out. You know, people like to throw things at me sometimes. <laughs> I'm always hoping it's like a Big Mac or something. So here's a guy in a sports car going 60 miles an hour. He throws a Big Mac at me at 60 miles an hour. I'm coming this way at 20 miles an hour. So now I want to ask how fast that Big Mac is going to be going when it hits my face. Well, it hits my face. So it's a simple equation. The velocity equals the 60 miles per hour of the car plus the 60 miles per hour of the hamburger being thrown from the car, and I'm going 20 miles per hour in the opposite direction, so that adds in with a plus sign, and you get the fact that this Big Mac is going to hit me in the face at 140 miles an hour, <laughs> which I'm good at catching those, by the way. <laughs> and so this is all simple physics, but once Einstein uh, figured out how to really do the, the transformations, out their own color. And he did it with uh, embankments and rulers, moving train, stationary people on the ground. I'm not going to go through a lot of this. Uh, 
the other thing he needed was a, some way to define a simultaneous time between two clocks either here or on the ground. And the way he did that was he said you set the clocks by uh, sending out a light pulse an equal distance in both directions and setting the clocks so that when the light pulse gets there it says this is time zero or this is a certain time. When you do this, just through reasoning, and any of you can do it, you will find out that once you assume the speed of light is the same whether you're on the moving train or on the embankment, that something funny is going on with the clocks. You'll also discover that something funny is going on with the lengths. They're not absolute. So neither time nor space is absolute. And you will see the details of this in, in later lectures, but for now let me just give you the consequences. The first one is that I can no longer claim that this, this Big Mac hits me in the face at 140 miles per hour because uh, one consequence is these velocities don't add like I did before. For me on my bicycle it's a very small correction so it may as well be 140 miles per hour. But we're going to look at a situation where this is much more important. So I'm going to just briefly describe the twin paradox. I like to do this because I'm an expert on twins. Turns out I'm married to one of a set of identical twins, so I consider myself an expert on the twin paradox. And there's more things in Einstein's relativity than it's a paradox, but we won't go into those. This is my wife, Marilyn, climbing a mountain. She likes to climb mountains. I used to say this is Carolyn, but it's really Marilyn too, because Carolyn doesn't like to climb mountains, she likes the beaches. So this is uh, the two of them together. And so what we're going to do here, oh, I just want to point out for later, their birthday's August 8th, 19 something. I can't tell you stuff like that or I get my lecture censored. But it's going to be important later in the lecture, just remember August 8th. And so what's the twin paradox? Well. You know, things are, don't always go smoother <coughs> when you're around some twins, so we're going to vote one of them off the planet. <laughs> and for the sake of my marriage, it's going to be Carolyn. <laughs> I have to do it that way. And we're going to send one of, them, one of them on a very ambitious trip. There's a galaxy that's not far from the Milky Way galaxy. And when I say not far, that just means it's the closest galaxy to our own galaxy. And it's two million light years away. So light takes two million years to get there. And it sounds like, you know, naively, if the old velocity addition things work, that it will take Carolyn a lot longer to get there than she has to live. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't like to hear that. But the way we're going to do it, we're going to see what relativity says about it. We're going to take a rocket ship, and this is a very special rocket ship. It's going to accelerate away from the Earth with an acceleration of exactly 1G. So she'll be comfortable. She'll feel like she's on the surface of the Earth all the time. It takes an incredible amount of energy, by the way. But she'll, uh, she's worth it. It's worth getting rid of her, right? So she'll accelerate 1G until she's halfway there. Then the rocket ship will turn around, decelerate at 1G, until she gets to Andromeda, where she can stop, check out the beaches, whatever she wants to do, and then she'll come back the same way. So, it doesn't sound possible, right? But what does relativity say about this? Well, it turns out it does take a long time. This says Carolyn is more than 80 years old when she gets back. Actually, she's older than that. <laughs> she, she, quite a bit older than that, but you know, just put your own number in there because I can't do it for you. But it's possible to do this trip in a lifetime. The trip itself takes approximately 60 years when she does that. So you can go 2 million light years in 60 years if you follow that particular, particular trajectory in, in space and time. And so she's going to get back and tell Marilyn all about it. But when she gets back, she finds out that Marilyn has been dead for some 4 million years. And she can't even find anybody who knew who Marilyn was. And, you know, hair is out of style. I mean, life is really <laughs> crazy. About that. So this, this is from the theory of relativity. I've had people tell me, oh, that's just a theory. Uh, you know, that probably wouldn't really happen. Fact of the matter is, 
the accelerators that I'm responsible for here at the lab get into this domain where things are going very, very close to the speed of light. And if this theory weren't correct, we would never be able to accelerate those particles to that energy because we would be putting in the wrong RF signal and everything. We have to use those equations from special relativity to know what's happening to the beam, to know what, what to do with it, because this really does work. So this is not just focus pocus and doesn't have anything to do with reality. It really is real. So that's to get you interested in this time problem. There's some other questions that I'm going to not belabor too much, but there is a question of macroscopic time, time that's passing in this room with us, and microscopic. And it turns out there's an important difference there. One of them seems to have a direction, and the other doesn't. And it has to do with the concept of entropy, which I didn't write down here. But I can show you what that is by showing you a special universe that I got to create, because I do that every once in a while. And when I created this universe, I put everything, whatever makes it up, the particles in this little corner and behind some potential barrier. And then it said, I'm going to have some fun and just let that barrier down all of a sudden. And what happens, of course, is since these things are colliding with one another, moving around because they have some temperature, they start spreading out and filling up the bigger space that they're in. So if you, I show you any one of these pictures and ask you which half was first and which was second, you would tell me that this one is definitely after this one, even though it would be possible that the time could run the other way. It's sort of like me telling you, be careful and be aware that all the air in this room has some very small probability of ending up in the corner over there. <laughs> and then we would all have to sprint over there to get a breath. It wouldn't last very long. You'd make a lot of noise when it came back out of the so time does have a direction, and this has to do with entropy. And, uh, but this kind of direction doesn't happen at the microscopic level. And so there's a question about how we got from a state of low entropy to start the whole universe, and then as time goes on, everything spreads out, scatters, more disorder. And you might ask, well, could disorder ever do what I just said? end up in a state of order where everything's in the corner of the room. And so that's uh, more of a philosophical question now because we don't know how to answer it. Maybe someday we will. And if you had this situation, which way would the clock be run? Probably not a meaningful question. Now just a little bit before we get to the break, we've talked about numbers, counting, and mathematics. And I told you it was important. So I'm going to give you an example about, of how we might have learned to count. And I learned this from a dog I had. The dog isn't with us anymore because dogs don't live that long. But my mother-in-law taught this dog, who was a relatively smart dog. I can't remember his ACT scores, but they were pretty high. <laughs> taught him to count. And the way she did it, was in a particular way, and then it makes you think about what counting is, and there are different levels of counting and sophistication. But we were having tacos one night, you know, with a grated cheese and everything, and she started playing with the dog. The dog was kind of old, but well known that he was a very intelligent dog. And so she started rolling the cheese into little balls, and she would put it on the edge of the table, and get him to bark the number of times that there were cheese balls. And if he there were three cheese balls, and he barked three times, he got the cheese balls. So he learned this very quickly, and he could count up to six or seven, somewhere in that area, very successfully. If you got more than that, he got very excited. Oh, boy, look what I'm going to get. Or if you got them too close together, he got confused. And if you watched him counting, you could see what he was doing. He would look at one, take note of it, and bark. Look at the next one, and bark. And look at the next one, and bark. So he wasn't he really had no concept of three. He was just matching the barks to the to the cheese balls, and it was very successful for him. He was sick for two or three days. <laughs> and, uh, so when you try to translate it, that into human experience and how we might have got started counting, when we became uh, uh, agricultural society, there were these two fellows, Zork and Moog, 
think that's the kind of names they had back then. And they, they each had cattle, and they were pretty proud of their cattle, and you know how guys are, they're always wanting to compare things, and they were trying to compare, Moog wanted to compare his herd to Zorks and prove that it was better, and vice versa. And so they didn't really have a good way of doing this. They didn't want to get the cattle all mixed up, because then they wouldn't know whose cow it is. And they figured out this scheme where maybe they could associate a stone with each one of them, and then they could pick up the stones and come and look at the stones and compare them. And it turned out that sort of worked, because they could see there was a difference in the, in the stones. There seemed to be, they had maybe the concept of more, but the numbers were so close that they needed a better way. So they invented a scheme where they came up with colored beads and they decided these beads, they agreed that these beads would be placed in a certain order and then you could associate a bead with each cow and they keep the leftover back here and that meant something. So when they both did that, they uh, ended up like this and they were still a little confused because it turns out Zork had two beads left, Moog only had one, so they decided Zork won this contest. He had the better than cattle. <laughs> they figured this out after a few years. Anyway, so that's how people started thinking about counting first, like you believe me, like I really know what people at this stage in history, but I'm guessing because my dog is a good source. Anyway, they developed <laughs> different ways of keeping track of this order numbers and so on. And an important thing was that they didn't have any concept of zero for a long, long time. And that came about later. But this concept of numbers got fairly sophisticated quickly as people tried to keep track of their land on the Nile and so on. And they learned these relationships for the triangle, Pythagoras theorem. This, by the way, was very mysterious. And it was considered somehow magic and Pythagoras had a cult that developed around him. And uh, if you told some of the secrets, the mathematical secrets that they learned, you could be killed because this was such a special thing. So numbers were really interesting in the beginning and they're still really interesting now. At first we only had the integers and people started figuring out we need more. There's something on here I haven't seen. <laughs> Oh, I don't remember putting that in. <laughs> anyway, uh, we made rational numbers where you can divide two numbers. Don't have time to give you the history of all of this. Pi came about, it was found that the ratio of the circumference of a circle to the diameter is not a number that you could write like this. And then people got the idea that negative numbers might be a good idea. We found them useful. And then the most amazing thing is the imaginary numbers, and part of the ama amazement is the fact that they're called imaginary, and that, I think, tends to confuse people a little bit. And, yeah, this was moved later on. Uh, however, these imaginary numbers turned out to be very useful in the history of mathematics, and I already mentioned that. So let me just tell you a little bit about the imaginary numbers. It came about in an attempt to to solve cubic equations. And there were two people involved in history, and this was still a time when people tried to keep uh, these mathematical uh, things somewhat secret, and this was somewhat uh, a difficult problem because this person figured out how to solve, I think it was this person, figured out how to solve the, the cubic equations using the mathematics. This person had done, done a lot of uh, I guess maybe I'm backwards. No, this is, this is the one who did it. And he was concerned that this somehow violated some principle of religion or something to have used the magic numbers to solve the cubic equation and get a real answer. And he was just a little worried and scared about what he had done. And in any case, both of these people get some credit for the invention of imaginary numbers. And now just before the break, I want to try and convince you that Mathema mathematicians, I've always envied mathematicians, can have interesting lives in history too. And in fact, a lot of them have had interesting histories. This is a young man, Evariste Galois, he was a Frenchman, 
he was one of these young guys uh, back during the time when there was a lot of turmoil in France, the French Revolution happened, and then they kept beheading people and things like that. And he was sort of one of those young hellraisers. And somewhere in there, he did study mathematics, but he was not well known for, for what he did with his math, math. And somewhere in there, like happens to many young men, he fell in love with a woman. And the story, there are different historical uh, versions of this story. I'll try to sort of tell you too. One of the stories is that the young woman wasn't really that interested in him. This is my favorite version. And this caused him to get depressed and uh, upset. And he went out and challenged a person to a duel who he knew full well would probably kill him. So that's my version. The other version is that the other guy had an interest in the woman and they fought over the woman. But like I said, my favorite story is that he was depressed. So anyway, he, he challenged this guy to a duel and the predict, predictable happened. He was killed, not immediately, but he was killed. But the, this is a version that's probably wrong too. The night before the duel, and it was probably days before the duel, he wrote down what he knew about mathematics that he thought was important and sent it to his friend. Can't remember his friend's name. But it turned out what he wrote down was the foundations of modern algebra and group theory. Very important contribution. And no one had actually known that this person was a, a genius and a, a good mathematician. And yet he had this big impact. And he died, as you can see, when he was, I think it was before actually he was 21 years old. And that was the end of him. But we've also learned in mathematics and physics that brilliant people like that usually make a big splash when they're young, Albert Einstein, and then they're useless after that anyway. <laughs> Maybe not. Theory, theory people tend to do things when they're young. So anyway, there's some interesting stories about mathematicians. I have known at least two that got killed in duels. I don't know why that fascinates me. <laughs> I've certainly never challenged anyone to. <laughs> okay, so summary so far, uh, we we're, we're figured out what we're, we're trying to learn about, and we haven't talked too much about our tools and things, we'll do that in the second half, we've talked a little about them. We have tried to put these space and time issues into the lecture, and uh, we won't do a whole lot more with that, but when we start talking about experiments, you'll see why it's important. So we're going to take a 10-minute break now.